best. All right, welcome back to another episode of Wine to the People. As you may have noticed, I'm not in my little home office in Melbourne. I'm back at the regular old studio, but I'm still doing it by myself and just going through a little bit of a deep dive onto one of my favorite styles of wine, and that is sparkling wine. Sparkling wine generally, I think, is one of the most joyous and I think celebratory styles of wine that kind of exist. When you think about sparkling wine, you think about good times. And I think in my experience, some of the best wines I've ever consumed have been sparkling wines. Like really top end champagne is just otherworldly and you smell it initially and you just go, this is going to transcend certain things. But there's also just way more styles of sparkling wine out there than just champagne and the traditional method that we're kind of used to. There's a lot more out there, there's a few actually. And I'm just gonna kind of quickly run through all of those today. Uh, first of all, uh, there's been a couple of wines kindly donated to us, not necessarily for this particular video, but that is the wonderful uh, Murak. Murak is a uh, wonderful producer here in South Australia, based out of the Vale, but sources fruit from all across South Australia. Upon initial release, which I remember trying back at Proof Wine Bar years ago and being blown away initially from his uh, first release, and he's continued that streak, but now he's actually had a bit of a focus on sparkling wine. So he kindly sent us a couple of bottles of his wonderful sparkling wine, which I'll kind of go through how good they are whilst talking about sparkling wines in general. But uh, first sparkling wine to talk about is the Ancestral Method, uh, which has kind of commonly now been known as Petiont Naturale or Petnat. Basically, this is the oldest form of sparkling wine that has ever been produced because every wine ever made has been Petnat at some stage. Basically, it's bottling whilst the wine is still fermenting. And the reason why this has kind of kicked off recently is that when you're doing that process, you can't do anything to it. You can't add sulfur, you can't add anything or take anything away. So it has been a bit of a pillar of the natural wine movement. So it has been really exciting to see that kind of enter the lexicon over the last 15 years or so, which is really, really exciting. Well, most champagnes used to be painting that way back in the day, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But basically what it is, get wine, grapes, crush, press, all the juice, let it ferment, and then when it gets just towards the end of the ferment process, chuck it straight into the bottle. So basically managing that pressure that's exerted by the fermentation or the carbon dioxide that's coming out, but you wanna also make sure it doesn't go in too late. So it doesn't produce enough carbon dioxide to make it fizzy and you end up getting like flat nat or just you know slightly sweet, unfinished wine. Basically, it's just a perfect little management process and I believe that's the way Murak does it here. But this is what we call the method ancestral, which is the proper, I guess, old school name of it. But let's give it a bit of a geek. So Murak's actually focused his brand into more than 50% of his wines are now sparkling wines, uh, both in this one and another one we'll try in a second. So I'm really excited to kind of see what he's doing with these over the last kind of couple of years. Oh, look at the foam on that. And already you can kind of see why Petnat gets a lot of people really excited it's because you can see that wonderful blush, pinky, peachy color, which you don't really get from heaps of wines out there, particularly in sparkling wines. And that's, I guess, from the point where you can actually just do whatever you want into Petnat. Since every wine is a Petnat at some stage, you can kind of make anything into a Petnat. So I've tried Shiraz Petnats, like Nebbiolo Petnats, all of these different things. So I think that's the playfulness of the style. So yeah, as you can kind of see, I'm actually extraordinarily impressed with the fizz here because it looks very, very fine and detailed, which you, like pet gnats can often be really, really foamy and bright because you're not really doing anything to us, a lack of control there. So the fact that we're getting this amazing beat is pretty impressive. Aromatically, it's got that fresh grape smell, that kind of, you know, lovely, just picked summery grape aromatic thing, that lovely kind of fresh strawberry, but it's got this lovely herbaceousness, that kind of like strawberry seed character, which I see in a lot of like really, really fine pet nuts, but it smells delicious, really fresh, very fruit forward, no real intervention here, but it looks the absolute goods and smells the absolute goods too. Yeah, it definitely has that classic pet nut feel, that lovely fruity, juicy, very grape-like, which I think, you know, is that lack of intervention here. But what I think is the most impressive here is the level of mousse and texture that he's been able to build with this particular style. So he's clearly got a really great hand on this particular method of production. So, so I kind of mentioned earlier how champagne basically always used to be method ancestral. And that was because hundreds of years ago, champagne actually used to just be rosé. And what happened is that in a couple of cool years, as they were making this, you know, champagne rosé, it got so cold during the winter time whilst ferment was still going on. Because remember, there was no um, additional yeast and there's no blanket 
blanketed or like heated tanks to kind of do this. It's all very, very natural winemaking. You know, we're talking like 15, 1600s. It got so cold during the winter time that they were sending the wines to bottle and they had a little bit of residual sugar in them. And then basically they sent them across the ocean to the UK. And as they arrived, the weather started to warm up and the fizz started to kind of occur. So the residual sugar left in the bottle started to kind of kick off another fermentation in bottle. As kind of summer came and people were starting to drink rosé, they were opening these bottles of champagne and they were slightly fizzy, which was a complete surprise. We all used to dry rosé. And as it turns out, people fucking loved it. And you can kind of see why, like how does that not scream a good time? So over the next few hundred years, a bunch of different processes were introduced into Champagne to kind of control this. And people like Verve Clicquot um, and Dom Perignon, so very, very famous Champagne houses are very responsible for the technical progression of Champagne to become like this iconic sparkling wine. This is what they all used to be. Instead of being viewed as a fault as it initially was, that kind of has now become a signature of the region. And people are now calling that the traditional method. And we have Morax's traditional method, Blanc de Blanc from the Adelaide Hills, from Kerry Gully. So this is Morax's little traditional method. So basically, he's fermenting a base wine dry, Chardonnay in this case, Blanc de Blanc equals 100% Chardonnay. Then he's basically making what they call a liqueur de tirage, which is a mixture of sugar and yeast or grape juice. He's basically making this little small volume of liquid that he's topping up every single bottle with. So he's taking this ferment of Chardonnay, putting almost full to the brim of bottle, and then he's topping up a little bit with this liqueur de tirage, and then basically shutting the cork in and then putting it on racks and he'll over the next you know, several months and years even, rotate the bottle slightly in a process called riddling to kind of agitate the yeast slightly, quarter turns at a time. And then over this period of time, we get this process called autolysis, which ends up adding this wonderful nutty savory character, which is why when you try a really, really nice champagne, there is that kind of brioche nutty savory element to it. So really, really detailed and intense process, but the result generally, if you know, if you've tried these styles of wine is absolutely fantastic. Basically he will open these bottles up, disgorge them. So getting all of the gunk out essentially, all the kind of dead yeast cells over that aging period in bottle. And then he will add cork to that. And then that will be ready for, for release afterwards. So that's what we have now is the final disgorge product. Is there any details in here? So yep, so he's whole bunch pressed to the Chardonnay, fermented it dry, matured it for 12 months in barrel first, which is amazing. Then he's at a tirage of 2023 vintage using wild yeast and bottled in house. So he's actually not added yeast here, which is pretty amazing. And then he's topped up the barrels here and then he's bottled it in May. So, and then hand disgorged in January 24. So he's aged it for 12 months in barrels and then it's done it about seven to eight months in bottle on under tirage and then discourse it afterwards, which is amazing. Really, really uh, intense process. And I believe this is another process called Brut Nature. So what a lot of producers do after they have discourse, they add a little bit of sugar to the wine and then balance that out. And that's why you get labeling terms like Brut and Sec, which is, you know, levels of sweetness in the wine. So basically what he's decided to do is forego that and it's zero added sugar and zero dosage. This is just the pure wine from the base ferment and then that adding of the Cote de Tirage to add that kind of secondary and that autolysis character. And then he's disgorged it and bottled it straight away. So this is gonna be pretty vibrant and very acidic. What I should actually tell you how to do is open a bottle of champagne or just a bottle of sparkling wine in general. So basically one hand around the cork, one hand around the bottle and you twist. And then basically just as you are about to get that cork pop, you, you keep the pressure on so you don't let it pop off and you get this little hiss. So, but you don't want it to go bang. It's not the F1. You only want a, a little hiss so you can retain as much of that carbonation as humanly possible. To be frank, I did a pretty good job there. Murac Blanc de Blanc Brut Nature from the Adelaide Hills. So not proper champagne because of course it's not from champagne, yada yada, but it made in that grower champagne style of no dosage, um, no added yeast as well. So really, really exciting stuff and very, very intense production. So let's have a little geese here. Color, pretty lovely. It's got a bit of haze to it, which is really cool. I guess that's the um, lack of fining and filtration there. And you know, that sticking to that very grower champagne method, that really hands off element, no added yeast, no dosage. Smells amazing. Smells like really fantastic Chardonnay. It's got that kind of lovely Adelaide Hillsy vanillary, banana, stone fruit, lemon character. It looks very, very Adelaide Hills, which is really exciting to see from wines like this. 
Well, it's quite frankly, fucking delicious. Tastes like fantastic Chardonnay, beautiful texture. And what we kind of talk about as far as in sparkling wines in texture, a thing called mousse, which is the fizz. And this has got a lovely creamy, like fine bead. And the bead is those kind of lovely little lines of fizz that are kind of popping up there. And then the description of the kind of those beads of like fizz appearing in your mouth and making this kind of like fresh whipped cream texture uh, alongside those wonderful flavors. So that's what we're talking about as far as structure and mousse uh, in sparkling wine. What I love about this is that it tastes like the hills. It's still got vibrant acid, but it tastes like, you know, really, really good Kerry Galley Chardonnay, but it's just got, just so happens to have fizz in it. It is fantastically well done. As far as that, nutty yeasty character it's pretty faint there is a bit of that kind of brioche and almond character but it's not really pronounced it's not really dominating the flavor of the wine basically i think for that reason is that you know it hasn't spent that long on lees in general it's only pretty spent you know seven or eight months or so from may to january so it's not been an extended period of time but it's still there it's a bit of a gentle kind of flavor element to the wine jordan's clearly spent a lot of fine detail to kind of make this the best wine he possibly can and he's done a pretty ripper job up here it is absolutely delicious and i think this is only about 50 bucks so this is really really good value and i'd be stocking my cellar with this pretty red hot quick and there was only 163 dozen bottled in may and disgorged in january so there's not that all that much of it out there so 50 bucks for a wine with this much detail to it is pretty fantastic so i'd be getting shit loads of this this is delicious Talking about, you know, how that wine is made, it's pretty clear that there is a lot of detail and a lot of craft that goes into it. Like having to do every single bottle one by one, adding that liqueur de tirage into the bottle, doing that riddling process, bottle, bottle, bottle. That takes a lot of labor and a lot of time. And Jordan does this pretty much by himself, maybe with a few friends helping him out. If you want to be a large winery, that's pretty intense. So in some places in Champagne, they've got these massive kind of robotic cubes that rotate. But what the Italians have done to kind of get over this, this intense labor cost to actually produce sparkling wine is, fuck it, let's just put it all in one tank. So they have come up with the method of Charmat, which is basically get a big tank, add your grape juice, add your yeast, add your sugar, put it all in one, kick off that ferment and send it straight to bottle. So very, very efficient. And as far as you can get that cost per bottle down in, in terms of production, and so you can get a bit more of a competitive retail price on sparkling wine, because you know, you look at most champagne prices or most really good champagne, it's quite expensive. You look at Prosecco, much, much cheaper. A bit of a showcase of that is a wine that we make, which is our Troppo Sparkling. This is Fleurio Peninsula Chardonnay. So taking some stuff that's not necessarily the most heralded as far as regions are concerned in South Australia, not necessarily the hills. Uh, so taking any leftover fruit from the year and stuff that hasn't been secured by other producers and turning that into something kind of, you know, giving some reasonable value to our farmers. This is a Blanc de Blanc as well, but made in a very, very different method. So immediately you can kind of see that it's a bit more of a foamier mousse. So it's not necessarily as fine and detailed as the Morax style. So that's a little bit more like detailed and finesse, whereas this one is a little bit more playful and a little bit more simple, which is, you know, kind of the true purpose of this particular wine. Whereas, you know, that's about 50 bucks. This wine is about $25. So it's basically all about, you know, making something that's a little bit more approachable and not taking the detail. And then, you know, there is a bit of a, I guess, an agricultural focus of this rather than a production focus. Charmat method really becomes really handy as far as getting that wine to market at a very affordable price. A lot paler, a little bit more primary fruit, a little bit more like kind of nectarine and stone fruit and citrus rather than that kind of like creamier textural vent of Chardonnay that Murak has been using. The mousse itself is a little bit foamier and kind of broader, but still got good structure, texture as well. It's just not as detailed. It's just a little bit more like, you know, fun and frivolic. It's not about that kind of finesse. It's a little bit more about that approachability. You know, overall, the wine's delicious. It's got a bit of sugar in here. So this is at a brute level of sugar. So we've added eight grams of sugar per liter for this particular style. So we get at that brute level and that's our dosage. That is our, just before bottling, add a little bit of sugar and then send it out. So it's a little bit more consistent and we get a little bit more of that balance between acidity to sweetness but overall the wine's yummy it's simple this is you know stuff for aperol spritzes this is stuff for dinner parties with people that don't really care about wine so this is definitely a bit more playful this is not wine nerd stuff if you want wine nerd stuff get on the other two sparklings get on this stuff if you just want something that you know you're going to turn into a you know a cheeky limoncello spritz or something like that this is the name of the game
All right, this is the final method of sparkling wine production. Uh, this is definitely the most downright dirty. And we're definitely doing this in way less of a controlled environment than this is generally done. This is injecting carbon dioxide into the wine to make a carbonated wine, much like a can of Coke, really. Uh, but this isn't how Coke's made. We've got a, <laughs> a plastic soft drink bottle and basically a full tank of carbon dioxide. And we've got this little nozzle at the top of the bottle and we've got this little thing. And basically the way we do it generally is in water and you pressurize it and then the carbon dioxide goes into the liquid. We've got an audience for this one uh, because I don't think this will go very well. Uh, a distiller Mitch has just said there's too much protein and there's not enough like, I guess, force to keep it in the bottle. So I think this is gonna go everywhere and which is why I'm wearing protective apron. So let's fucking find out. Let's fuck around and find out. <sighs> Thank Christ. Let's go again. <laughs> Wait, and then, okay, so. Generally speaking, I'm running it back. I'm going again, I reckon. Get some more fizz in there. So generally we pump this like two or three times in the bar, is that right? Yeah, two or three. Two or three, get some extra fizz. Yeah, oh, shake. <laughs> Jesus, don't point it at me when you do. <laughs> so yeah, we got, some, we got fizz in there. That is absolute carbonated wine. Uh, and then the question is to see what happens when we open this. It might just go fucking bang. Boom. Fucking, what was, what was I worried about? What are you all worried about? And then, therefore, we have just injected the absolute tiniest amount of carbon dioxide in there. There's a bit of foam in there. It doesn't go very well. It's generally how most carbonated wines end up looking. That wine does not hold carbon dioxide all that well when it's just pure CO2. It needs to be a byproduct of fermentation. So, there it is. It smells like wine. and it's got a little bit of fizz. It's actually held it pretty well, so double pumping the wine and that actually kind of works A-OK. -okay. The wine itself is fine, I just pulled up a random clean skin bottle that we've had for years while running around, but it actually holds uh, a little bit of like gentle slight frizzante to the wine, so it's actually turned out well, but uh, I thought that was gonna go horribly wrong, so not the greatest content, but it definitely fucking works. Don't try it with the soda stream though. Yeah, don't do it with a soda stream, That's, that, you need the proper rig. But yeah, uh, myth busted. And that's sparkling wine there for you, so fucking see you next time. <laughs>